Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Friday, July 30, 2021. I'm Ash Bennington, joined today by our own Jack Farley and our guest, Mark Ritchie II, managing member, RTM. Here's what we're looking at right now. Most major U.S. equity indices down on the week despite a generally strong earnings season. Amazon disappointed yesterday after the bell, missing on the top line and the bottom line. That's revenue and net income. Amazon stock looks like down about 7.5% for the day. Once again, for the week, most of the major U.S. equity indices are lower, especially NASDAQ Composite and NASDAQ 100, both off over 1% on the week. One exception to this is the Russell 2000 looks like up about 0.6% percent on the week. Jack, what are you looking at today? Well, it's not only the stocks that disappoint in their earnings that are down today, Ash. Uh, Chevron and ExxonMobil, those oil giants, reported uh, earnings, and they beat expectations by a healthy margin. However, uh, the stocks were down. They both were looking a little bit pale, particularly ExxonMobil, which was down about 2.4 percent. ExxonMobil announced it would not be pursuing share buybacks. Instead, it would be focused on uh, paying back its debt, the responsible choice. Chevron did announce buyback plans. Uh, Ash? Yeah, also today, announcement, Kathy Wood taking a stake in Robinhood, uh, $45 million in the equity in the stock. Um, also, Kathy Wood, we should say, uh, completed her fifth part of the interview today uh, with Kirill Sokolov on Real Vision for Real Vision subscribers. We're going to take a clip of that a little bit later uh, in the day. Mark, give us a sense of what you're looking at. It's been a couple of weeks since you've uh, been back. Tell us what you're looking at today. Well, uh, we could start with Amazon, I guess. Uh, chalk that one up in the loss column for myself. And you know, we talked about mega cap tech the last time I was on, and I, and in some ways, this is sort of a proxy for what I think we've been seeing now for the better part of five, six months in the equity market, which is this sort of continued rotation, which I've talked about before. And you know, last time I said if if I was going to get more aggressive on the long side, I wanted to see mega cap tech break to new highs, and then to see breath confirm, and then ideally the Russell follow suit. Well, we got the first part. The mega cap tech broke, broke to new highs. Breath did not confirm, and certainly uh, the small caps did also not follow suit. And now you're seeing, you know, the, I don't want to say mega cap tech fail outright, but Amazon's breakout definitely failed outright today, um, you know, and lieu of, Full disclosure, I bought that breakout. I got stopped this morning. So as I said, chalk that one up in the loss column. And we're actually seeing the breath uh, under the surface deteriorate even more. So the last time I was on, I highlighted you know, the advanced decline line. It did not confirm the new highs we had in the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ kind of briefly made new highs last week. Advanced decline line didn't make new highs. The percentage of stocks above their 50-day moving average uh, is now at 37%, which means there's roughly only one third of the NASDAQ that is trading above its respective 50. That's not a very powerful herd, if you will. And so, you know, those are, those are signs that are keeping me sidelined. And the Russell is basically in no man's land. Mm. Last week, we tested the lows of the range. Uh, we're firmly have gone nowhere now for about five months. And that's a pretty good proxy, you know, sort of for the the average stock in the market. Yeah. Jack, jump in. Well, Mark, I want to know uh, what can we glean from the advanced decline line, from the breadth, the fact that not as many uh, stocks in the stock market are sharing in the gains of the broader stock market. What does that tell you? And what, if anything, can we, does it, does it portend for the future? Sure. And, you know, listen, breadth is something that you want to see uh, sustaining in advance. So if you look back, probably of all the times I've been on Real Vision, one of the times I was the most bullish uh, was last summer in June. We had m some major, what I consider significantly bullish breadth indicators. Uh, well, I, I just quoted the percentage of stocks above their 50-day moving average. Last June, it hit over 90 percent. 
That is an ex basically saying that nine out of 10 stocks are in firm, strong uptrends. Uh, now it's you know just under four. Uh, so if you think of it in terms of, and the way I think of it, you know, time frame is important, but uh, I look at the 50-day moving average as a proxy for risk. If a stock or any market, generally speaking, is going to have a precipitous decline, it's going to be when it's below the 50. Usually, a stock will break the 50 first. And I use the analogy sometimes, you know, when your mom used to say, nothing good ever happens after midnight, you know, or whatever, or, you know, whatever your curfew was. <laughs> your curfew might have been 8 o'clock. Some people's was 2 in the morning. Whatever it was, that's when your parents said, hey, the reason you got to be in by then, nothing good ever happens after then. Well, it, it, as far as the stock market is concerned, nothing good happens below the 50-day moving average. So when more stocks on average are trading below the 50-day moving average, that, that is a, it's a caution flag for me. Yeah. Mark, let me ask you this. As we talk a little bit more about your philosophy and how you think about markets, tell us a little bit about what you do at RTM, how you trade, what your time horizons are, and how do you think about markets doing what you do? Uh, sure. Big question, obviously. Well, the biggest thing is I always think risk first. And I'm always thinking about the risk reward relationship. And, and I, you know, we're directional managers. Uh, and, you know, there's sort of two proxies or, or, or two vehicles, um, you know, that I manage. One is, you know, our private pool uh, for friends and family. And that's basically where I've managed 100 percent, you know, of my personal wealth and sort of developed, you know, our process over the years. And then we just have a, a tactical, long-only, um, better risk-adjusted, uh, long-side exposure to equities uh, that's open you know, to pretty much any, anybody. That's really a tactical alternative to buy and hold. Um, but you know, as, a, as a general rule, uh, I am always trying to manage risk in real time, which means, and then gauge uh, the information as it changes. So I, I'm trying to be flexible with the idea of really trying to assess when is the right time to be aggressive. I don't think the market is always healthy. And I would argue that in, again, in any market, you know, it was said 100 years ago, the market's healthy two to three times a year. Expose, you know, the maximum amount of your capital during those periods, play defense the rest of the time. That's an oversimplification of kind of how I want to look at markets all the time. Oh, I want to ask you a few things, Mark. You want to play offense when it's healthy and play defense when it's not. What game are you playing now? And if I can just zoom you in a little bit, last time you were on, you were very constructive on the big tech, as you said. Um, and we can actually um, put a chart up just of Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft over the past year. They were basing for a very long time, not a huge breakout. Um, and you were expecting them to break out, which they did. However, this week was a little bit of a speed bump in them. Um, so just, just walk us through how you're seeing the outlook for tech. Are you playing offense or are you more on the defense? I am definitely more defensive right now. I would have said, you know, in early July, I was a little more um, long and looking to get aggressively long should a few things play out. And it was sort of like we had the first thing and then nothing else confirmed. So, you know, it's sort of like you, you put the foot on the accelerator, getting ready to, you know, to gas it and then quickly riding the brake. And now I would say, you know, even if you look at, you look at today's action in Amazon, it did not trade well. So, and, and I'm a big believer in the headlines are, headlines are great, um, but I'm more interested in the response to the news than the news itself. Um, and, you know, we closed, we really had the, probably the worst weekly close in Amazon since you know last October. We took out the 50-day on volume, uh, and as I said, I was hoping, you know, we were in a one-year base. Well, this now it's kind of in the penalty box for me. So I'm holding, you know, more cash than I, you know, than I have in in, in probably a little while. So as you look at these markets, particularly U.S. equity markets, uh, what is your framework here? Is it purely technical? You're looking at the price action. Do you have a macro framework that you're looking through? Are you factoring in uh, some of the headline risk, news cycle stuff, uh, or are you just looking at this on technical factors alone? Uh, it's a combination. Uh, I would say, though, with risk management being prudent, um, we have some hardcore technical rules first, or the way I often like to trade it is I will. 
I love fundamentals, but I don't want to trade them without technical confirmation. Mm. And I'm not going to trade certainly aggressive on fundamentals alone. So I think of, you know, I think of, think of the fundamentals as like the temperature of the water, but the technicals are like the wind. I'm not headed mm. in aggressively when that wind is, you know, blowing in my face. Uh, and ideally, it's like you want, you want everything to line up. Well, it doesn't happen all the time. That's kind of my point in terms of why I think if you want to, if you want to do good risk adjusted performance, you notice I said risk adjusted, not just performance, you know, anybody can put up a good year. Uh, you know, any, anybody who just went limit long, anything last year wound up putting up a good year, but I'll bet their risk adjusted performance has hit a pretty decent speed bump. Uh, if they, if they did, if they weren't prudent with sort of risk management, does that make sense? It, yeah. it makes a lot of sense, especially what you said about if you went limit long anything, you felt like a genius. I bet there are a lot of people out there who went, you know, limit long coffee futures and they feel like a genius. Yeah. <laughs> so, by the way, you mentioned Amazon on the week. It looks like off 9% on the week, uh, up, I mean, 9, 9.06% 9 on the week, uh, up year to date 2.14% on the year. Uh, looks like up a shade under 9%, trailing 12 months. Wow. Yeah, and I would, I would just add too. You know, if you look at that, I I mentioned the 50-day, you know, sort of as a as a guardrail or uh, you know an indicator, even on an individual basis. Okay, we just closed below it on big volume. That is not, that's not your your uncle selling a couple hundred shares in his Roth. That is major institutions that piled out in mass today. Uh, which is why I would say, in the short run, it needs time at best. Yeah, here's a there was a big story out this afternoon uh, out of CDC. This came out around 2 p.m. Eastern time. Markets seem to be shrugging this off, ignoring it. I, I think it's actually even hard to find when you're looking uh, cruising across the news. But basically, CDC uh, has said that their new mask guidelines uh, were caused in part uh, by the Cape Cod outbreak uh, in Massachusetts, which apparently shows uh, that the amount of viral load and transmissibility is not changed uh, by the uh, mRNA vaccines. So it seems as though it just limits the symptoms. Is this something that you think about, price in? I mean, you know, obviously none of us are epidemiologists. You read a headline like that. What, what does it mean, if anything, for these markets? <laughs> Boy, uh, yeah, I think you said it when you said none of us are epidemiologists, and uh, yeah, I don't know that there's a tougher job in the world right now. Uh, well, here's what I would say about the virus: is that I think you know we we had was it last Monday, you know, on on sort of the wake of the the variant starting to spike in different pr places, we had a brief sell-off that was immediately met with buying. Now I've been watching really closely to see, you know, was that sort of that first little crack in the dam before, in, in terms of equities, before we see a larger wave of selling. Well, so far, you know, the market's just kind of lifted right back to the highs. Um, but I'd be watching really closely here. August also, seasonally for equities, isn't generally a very good or strong month. I don't put a lot of stock in that, but, you know, you, you have a little lower volumes, things like that. So we could see a spike in volatility. The interesting thing, though, is this whole element of, okay, if we get a spike in the COVID variant and we see, you know, maybe that pushing back on some of this inflation impulse, is that going to firmly keep the Fed on the sidelines and sort of perversely keep the bid under equities because right. they're, they're going to keep the party going? I don't, I honestly don't know. Uh, this is sort of where it's like, Look at how the groups are trading. Uh, and, you know, my thing, follow the process. My process doesn't really have a, you know, what, what is the latest stat in terms of COVID in it? And I, I generally always tell people, when in doubt, follow your process. Mine is to look at the stock, see how growth is trading relative to other things, and take that as one of my sort of major leading indicators. Well, mm. growth didn't trade that well this week. It really hasn't traded, you know, well the last two weeks. It's been pretty chunky at best. Um, that coupled with breath, I think right now you've got to, you know, at least, you know, be cautious in the short term. Yeah, I should just say that Cape Cod story is about specifically Delta variant, if I didn't mention it before. Jack, jump in. We were just yeah. talking. Uh, just, just what Mark was saying, I just looked up uh, 
um, Carnival Cruise Corp and Norwegian Cruise Corp, probably the stocks most exposed to COVID, and they were both down 4 and 5 percent today, um, perhaps related to that. Ash, I also saw a story that Walmart is going to require all of its employees to be vaccinated, um, which I don't know if it's bullish or bearish for, for the market to get against the virus. But, um, yeah, it's, it's increasingly becoming apparent that, you know, the, the mood uh, that gripped the world three months ago, that we were, it was, we were going to fully emerge from COVID and essentially it was going to not exist in terms of, not in, actually exist, but like we, we would be fully back to normal. It's, it's quite clear that we're not going to be fully back to normal. Maybe 80% back to normal, but not 100%. Yeah, listen, and put this under the category of things that I don't really understand, but reading the story, the mainstream news story, Wall Street Journal did a good job covering this. It seems as though what they're suggesting, based on the interpretation of what's coming out of CDC, uh, is that vaccination does not stop the spread of the virus. Isn't that the logical implication? Uh, if the transmissibility is just as high or nearly as high in people who are vaccinated, it seems that the implication is that while the virus will prevent you, the individual who receives it, from getting as sick, it certainly seems, again, unless I'm misreading it, that the implication is here, for example, in the case of Walmart, uh, that vaccinating uh, the workforce will not slow the spread. Again, unless I'm misinterpreting it, uh, unless there's more nuance to the story than it seems, uh, this is a, this is, it's a complicated story. And, you know, once again, we're left doing what we need to do here, which is to try and sort out what's happening in markets. But these are real curveballs coming at us. Yeah, I have a question I want to ask, Mark, which is you said that your uh, outside fund is long only. Does that imply that you, the fund for your uh, you know, personal and, and your, your family and, and friends or what, um, does that, is that shorting stocks? And if so, what are you short and why? Or where do you see short opportunities and why? Um. So yeah, in the yeah in the pool vehicle, we can really trade anything, um, multi asset class, multi time frame. Um, you know, the other one, like I said, is really more of you know a a better risk adjusted um, say alternative to the index. Uh, currently, I'm not really short anything. Um, that I, I mean, I'm trying to even think. We have we have you know quite a number of positions. Certainly, nothing meaningfully. Um, I did have a hedge on last week, sort of short the arc, ironically, against some other growth names. I know you guys had Kathy Wood on this week. Uh, I love Kathy Wood. That was that was more of just a proxy for risk because arc has really become kind of a place a lot of managers go, um, you know, for sort of that high high growth, higher risk um, uh, place in the market. Right. But cur currently, I'm not really short anything, and I'm holding a decent amount of cash. It's you know the way I, way we sort of operate is hey, as as we get more and more um, cautious, it's you know the the least high conviction ideas hit the exits first or hit their stops, uh, and then you know highest conviction lasts, and even those you know may get potentially hedged off or sold, uh, depending if things you know continue to deteriorate. So, Mark, Mark, what are your uh, highest? Um, sorry, Ash. What yeah, I was just going to say. Speaking of speaking of Kathy Wood, uh, I know one of the topics we wanted to talk about here today uh, was Bitcoin. Let's jump in and take a look at the clip uh, from today's episode of Kathy Wood and Kirill Sokolov. You said that you think Bitcoin could well sell at five hundred thousand in five years. I'd love to hear your investment case for Bitcoin and how it fits into your broader investment thesis. But also touch on what you said is that Bitcoin could eventually replace bonds in the 60-40 stock bond portfolio, which I think is an amazing concept. And what is the end destination for Bitcoin? Where is it all going to go? The $500,000 net number came from uh, work that we did around institutions, uh, including uh, pension, sovereign wealth funds, also included uh, high net worth individuals and a global study. And we said, if we did, uh, well, first of all, let me back up and say, this is the first new asset class since the 1600s, equities. Uh, and it exhibits a, a very low correlation uh, in terms of returns relative to all the other asset classes. In fact, um, in our paper on the institutionalization of uh, Bitcoin in particular, uh, we showed that correlation matrix and the highest correlation was to real estate. 
that was interesting. But if you look at the correlations generally, very low. Now, any institutional uh, asset allocator is looking for those low correlations, right. uh, probably also looking at the bond market and saying, you know, how low is low? And oh, by the way, yes, I am worried about these corporate credits. Well, there you have it, guys. Potential $500,000 price target on Bitcoin and talking about the potential of Bitcoin to replace bonds in the 60-40 portfolio. Wow, that's a headline. Mark? Yeah, bold, uh, bold call. Really good stuff. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm a fan of Kathy Wood. I don't know her personally. And I think what I took away and, and watching the different sections, and we were having a conversation about this sort of, you know, off channel is it's just a good exercise in original thinking. So I think a lot of people watch her or listen to her and they immediately go to why they disagree or agree you know, and rather than taking her sort of framework for what it is and trying to break down the arguments and running it through your own process, ideally, or, or maybe allowing it to interact and collide with your own worldview. And, be, and again, I've made this point many times. It's not about like, is somebody 100 percent right or wrong? Uh, and if you if you look at some of the calls she's making, you know, based on some of her research, she doesn't have to be right on all these ideas because she probably only needs to get one or two of them right. And if you manage risk properly, one of those is going to pay for, you know, all of her misses. Yeah. I think one of the most impressive things about Kathy Wood is that she always shows her work and there's always a detailed thought process behind it. Talking of which, Jack, I know you've been looking into some aspects of the correlations that Kathy was talking about. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for that, Ash. Uh, before we get into correlations, I just want to say I think um, Mark is dead on about Kathy makes these predictions and she doesn't have to uh, be right on everything. She has proven herself to be very good at risk management. You saw that she was selling Tesla near the highs of, of January and February. And again, we know this because she rep reports her holdings uh, daily. Um, and likewise, she got out of, of China early. Um, but yeah, Ash, thank you for um, setting me up. So she, at the end of that clip there, noted that Bitcoin was uh, fundamentally uncorrelated. And she referred to a paper, which I actually found. Um, let's actually put this chart up right now. It's a chart, but it's very complicated, uh, Ash. I know you and Mark and I were trying to decipher it earlier. Um, but it, it essentially shows the different correlation distributions of a 90-day rolling correlation between Bitcoin and core assets like the S&P 500, like gold, like oil. Um, and the S&P 500 is in the top left, and it appears that it is rather uncorrelated that if you take all these distributions um, over time. And this, of course, is from the work of ARK Invest uh, analyst Yassine Elmandra. Um, Let's go to another chart of, of Elmandra's, and they show this thing over time. What I noticed, Ash, is that you see a significant spike up um, for the correlation between S&P 500 and, and Bitcoin, um, as well as between gold. So I did my own chart, um, which we can go to here, which is the 90-day correlation between the S&P 500 and Bitcoin. And you'll see that if you take it from 2010 or 2011, it does seem fundamentally uncorrelated until you get to 2020. And you see that's a that's quite a big uh, step up there. So it seems like since March of 2020, since the pandemic, a lot of these risk assets have been trading alike. So um, let, let's uh, take that chart down. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if uh, it returns to becoming correlated and uncorrelated and correlated and uncorrelated, or if we stay in that uh, if this is re regime for a longer amount of time. Yeah. You know, talking about Bitcoin, I want to go back to Mark. Mark has some very interesting thoughts on some of the technical factors, uh, the way that Bitcoin's been trading. And I have to say, as we're having this conversation earlier, I thought, Mark, your view on this was almost a clinic of how you think uh, particularly about technical factors, how you think about positioning, uh, how you think about support and resistance levels. Let's walk through that, because I think it's something that our viewers are going to find very helpful. Sure. So yeah, let me let me start by you know sort of where I'm at currently, and uh, I would say my view is a little differentiated in the sense that I'm kind of in neutral. Uh, I'm a longer term bull, but in the short term, I'm kind of in neutral when it comes to uh, Bitcoin and, and crypto overall. Well, and this is where the technicals sort of play in. And right now, it seems to me like it's everybody's on one side of the ship or the other, right? The, right. 
the perma bulls are bears. And I'm saying there's, based on how I look at markets, there's, say, no reason to be aggressively long Bitcoin in the shorter time frames right now. Now, why do I say that? Well, because we just had an enormous break. And now it looks like we're trying to bounce and put in some type of a bottom. Sure, the bulls can say, yeah, we rallied from 30 to 40. Here we go. Um, but if you look at what happened, and, and this is where I would say, it's, this isn't about Bitcoin in terms of the, the call I would make is we just need some time, is when markets have a break that big, it requires uh, time for things to heal. And, and I don't like to trade anything aggressively on the long side or the short side, really, but specifically the longest side where you have trapped supply over the market. What I mean by that is the bigger the break, uh, there is more overhead pressure that is sitting uh, via trapped longs who are waiting for rallies to sell into. So right now, anybody who bought above 45,000, say, in Bitcoin is stuck. And they are there. If they didn't get blown out, and, and they're any type of a week long, they are waiting saying, oh, dear God, please give me 45, 50,000 and I'll sell out, you know, at even or a small loss. Uh, con and likewise, you have anybody who picked bottoms between 32 and 29,000 is right. going to be potentially looking to take profits. And this is why, you know, the analogy I, I, I use, and this comes from a friend of mine uh, who's taught me a lot of this stuff, that the bigger the break, it's just like to your own body. If you, if you tweak something, you can come back pretty quickly. If you sprain something, it takes a little more. You break a leg, you're, you're not out running miles the next day. And I'm saying Bitcoin had a, and, and the digital asset ecosystem. I mean, when I run through the top 30 crypto charts, they all look like there's a lot of overhead supply sitting over these markets right now. And what I mean by that is longs that are going to potentially be looking to sell into rallies. Yeah. I'm shocked to see how quickly we have blown through nearly 30 minutes here today. I was wondering, Mark, can we do a quick speed round? A couple of questions, get them out there? Why not? We absolutely. Fantastic. This one comes to us from TomTom. Tom. How do you benchmark a person's risk-adjusted return, something that you mentioned earlier? Uh, and he's thinking particularly of the case of retail traders. How do you benchmark risk-adjusted return? Uh, I, would, I would take, um, and, and Peter Brandt's a really good one to follow on this type of stuff. Um, I would take their compounded annual growth rate uh, relative to their drawdowns. Mm. So um, CalMar is one he likes. I like or, or the pain to gain ratio would be two of the most uh, of the better ones. Jack Schwager also highlights this in some of his Market Wizard books. But the idea being, so if you take pain to gain, all that is is a a a division between your upside returns divided by the absolute value of your downside. I.e., if I made ten percent, but I had to put Ash through a twenty percent drawdown, you know, the, the pain to gain is very low. If I, if I gave him 10%, but he only had a 2% drawdown, the CalMar and the pain to gain is going to be much, much higher. So it's sort of a representation of skill in that regard, at least the way I, I look at it. Yeah. Here's another quick one. This one comes to us from Hugh Meyer. Uh, and the question is, once again, for you, Mark. Do you have concerns for big cap tech feeling the heat from the Biden administration, a la China and Xi, uh, from a longer term perspective? Effectively, what he's saying is there's a track crackdown in tech in China. Uh, do we have the fear that something like that, uh, probably not exactly like what's happening in China, of course, but do we have a fear that maybe something like that could happen here in the United States? <laughs> You know, the short answer for me is generally no, because I tend to be gone before people realize what's why, before the ultimate uh, underlying evidence for what's going on emerges. You know, so let's say Amazon drops another 5% next week and 10 after that and finds out, who knows, maybe, maybe the U.S. government is going to crack down on them or they're going to have some major squeezing, squeezing of their margins. Well, this is why I respect the technicals and when I see heavy volume selling at a stock trading poorly like it did today, I'm out. Uh, so I don't have to worry. I don't have to forecast those types of things that are, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, well beyond my area of competence to be able to predict right now. Yeah. Jack, as we get close to the end here, final thoughts, final questions for Mark. 
Hmm. Well, I, I think I'd like to add about the risk return uh, ratio that a lot of institutional hedge fund managers, in addition to targeting their returns, they target their volatility or their drawdowns because they don't want to have get angry phone calls from clients or even worse, having to give their clients their money back because they're demanding, you know, a redemption. I think that, you know, as such, they hedge funds are inclined and an institutional model are inclined to take short volatility bets, even when it's not prudent. And I think that that offers a broader opportunity to, you know, uh, less institutional people, probably like Mark, as well as, you know, um, the like, tr uh, in, you know, retail traders, really, to, to take big bets. Um, because you know they don't have any clients who, who are going to make angry phone calls. Yeah, Mark. Final thoughts as we come to the end. You know, right now uh, it's I'm in wait and see mode. You know, yes, the the trend is still your friend. Uh, I'm not saying you go completely to cash. Uh, you certainly could if you're very tactical or nimble. But you know, I would say you know I'm more firmly in neutral and kind of riding the break here until we see how things shake out. If breath improves and, and we see specifically small caps really start to trade well, I'll change my tune quickly again. You know, I like to try and stay flexible and bend with the market, not argue with it. So that's where, that's where I'm at currently. Um, again, always holding the right to change my mind. But yeah, going into the weekend right now, uh, holding a decent amount of cash and waiting to see how things unfold. If I may ask, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I jump in. Close, yeah. Just um, really quick, uh, Mark. What? So, so, other than cash, what assets are you moderately constructive on at all? Is it the safer assets like the utilities, uh, the real estate? Um, if you're not willing to go into those high beta names, well, sure. I mean, I'm not saying you. And this is I've made this point in Real Vision before too. Normally, when utilities are trading really well relative to growth, you know that that just doesn't have me as interested uh, because I'm looking for alpha, um, not for a place to hide. You know, so I'd rather I'd rather be nimble, hide in cash, you know, sit in cash until, you know, the higher alpha areas are are really trading well, or that risk on move is back. Um, not saying you couldn't do that. That's the advantage, of course, of being tactical. Um, the disadvantage is, you know, you're not going to catch any upside if utilities have a nice move. I'm okay sitting it out because I think I can make up the difference. You know, yeah. when when my pitch comes across the plate. Yeah. You're fine fading a three percent move in in Coca-Cola. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to fade it either. I'm just, uh, you know, I'll leave that. I'll leave that to somebody else. Yeah, very well said, Jack. Thanks for joining us, Mark Ritchie. A second, always a pleasure. Great to be on, guys. Thanks for watching, everybody, and thanks for your questions. Have a great weekend.